Welcome to the Oh Hell No podcast, where Kay Nicole delivers a daily dose of inspiration by discussing passion, purpose, and struggle with people who are living their best life doing what they love. Here's Nicole. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today I have Phil Sylvester. He's all the way in Sydney, Australia, and he is with us today. He is the spokesperson for a global travel lifestyle brand, and he's also a travel insurance provider, and he's the author of hundreds of articles on staying safe while traveling. He is a travel expert, and I'm so happy to have him here today. So thank you for being on the show. Welcome, Phil. Thank you very much. And the the beauty of being in Australia on the other side of the world is it's probably already tomorrow for you. So the world <laughs> doesn't end tonight. We're okay. <laughs> yeah, well, it's Thursday night here. So oh, no, Friday morning. <laughs> yeah, you're you're already in, on Friday. So this is going to be so much fun for me because one, I love to travel, but I don't love to travel everywhere. And two, I can't wait to talk about all the crazy stuff that I see on the news about traveling because I'm one of those scary travelers. So I have so many questions for you. Okay, let's get into it. I love that. (laughs) (laughs) But before we talk about travel, I want to hear about this 20 year broadcast journalist career. How did you (laughs) get into journalism? What were you doing? And why did you leave? Uh, Well, um, my mother uh, says that I declared I wanted to be a journalist when I was about nine years old. So um, and I I always did, you know, have a um, I did like the way that news was created. And I really did think that that would be a great career for me. So I went after it. And after a few stumbles going through college, um, you know, drinking too much and not studying enough, (laughs) Mm. a few of those things, I managed to uh, come out with a journalism degree and started work in the industry. And it was 25 years, I sort of started off on a local newspaper and then I uh, was lucky enough I applied for um, a cadetship which is more than an internship it's like a paid junior position at the uh, national television broadcaster in their newsroom in my hometown of Perth where I grew up Uh, so I moved into television pretty early on and then moved over to the commercial side one of the Australian networks and worked for them in Perth and then in Melbourne and then in network headquarters in Sydney, you know, became a TV producer, seen some amazing things, been part of some amazing stories. As one of the um, one of the news camera operators explained it, it's like having front row seats to history when you work in a news broadcast field like that, because you often, you know, are especially if you go out on the road, you're actually on the scene of historic events that occur. But even if you're back in the office and you're putting stories together, then you're one of the first people in the world to see the images that come from it because you're sort of compiling those into stories. So, you know, you've become a bit of a storyteller yourself as well, just trying to, you know, get the truth there out to people. So, yeah, sort of always wanted to be a journalist. Tick, did it. Wow, that's really cool. I wanted to do that too. When I first went away to college, I wanted to, you know, be an anchor person. But then I was like, Ooh, what if I like, don't pronounce words properly? And then I sound dumb? Or like, what if they send me to these crazy places? And you know, I don't want to go like, I just thought of all the dumbest things why I shouldn't pursue that and sometimes I regret it but I feel like if I was supposed to pursue it it would have you know something would have led me in that direction you know so yeah you know but there is a lot of there are a lot of people around you to support you when you're doing that kind of job so you know if you're worried about putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable Somebody will, uh, <laughs> somebody will correct you, and right. you know you you can you can learn from. The, I mean, it's an amazing industry. There are people who are still in it who've been in it for years and years and years, and there's a lot of knowledge sharing going on. So I understand how it can seem, um, you know, pretty scary. But there's a lot of support out there. 
you know, there's also a lot of stress that goes with it. I know people who I've worked with because of the things that they've done and they've seen, they've suffered from PTSD. Wow. So, you know, you get to see some pretty horrific things as well, sadly. So there's, you know, a lot of support there as well. I mean, it just used to be that everybody, you know, would finish their their daily job and then go to the bar and drink heavily to try and deal with what they've seen. But there's a lot more support around that these days, a lot more official support. So, yeah, it's a bit of a community. Sure is. Mm. So what did you not love about that work overall? Well, I got sacked in the end. Oh, okay. <laughs> As you do in broadcast media. I know guys who have been sacked half a dozen times, um, you know, because they're very high stressful situation. There's a lot of personal politics gets involved. But I was involved in a bit of a, you know, a wasn't anything. Nobody died. It wasn't serious. But the, it, one of the programs I was putting to air was a bit of a calamity. And um, so, you know, I was told it was time to go take a break. And I moved from television into radio at that time. So, um, yeah, it was interesting. But what did I not like? In hindsight, I, um, uh, I was a little bit jaded with, uh, with it as well because – after a while, it can seem like that the job is putting the uh, appropriate cliches in the correct order. You know, there's kind of a formula that goes for it and um, it's just rinse, repeat. I, I, and the moment that really struck me was I remember there was another terrible earthquake somewhere. I think it was Turkey. Um, buildings had collapsed and people were trapped. And of course, I read about this as soon as I woke up in the morning and was checking the the news to see what sort of day we had ahead of us. And I remember thinking to myself, I know exactly how today's going to go. I know exactly, um, you know, the story that we will write. And I know that in 36 hours from now, somebody will be miraculously pulled alive from the rubble. And it was like, oh, my word, it's just, it's become... A massive cliche in itself mm -hmm. and I remember thinking it's probably time to have a change and go do something else and then of course you know my boss stepped in and made that decision for me <laughs> but but even that was fine you know I, like, I was out of work for three days I didn't even get a week off until I was you know doing something else and then soon after that I moved over to radio and became the executive producer of a uh, talkback radio program on the most popular talkback radio station in Australia. And that was even it, even more exciting than television because it was so immediate. Yeah. You didn't have to worry about going out and shooting the pictures and coming back and editing them and it taking five hours to get something to air. You know, all you needed basically was a telephone and a, a reporter on the other end. And it was so immediate and it was fantastic. The stories that you could break on that and the, because you didn't have to finesse the imagery that goes with it, you could just have a conversation and things would happen right in front of your very ears, so to speak. So I did that for another five years and that was, that was really exciting as well. Wow, that is so fascinating. Look at you, Phil. <laughs> I know. I love and, it. You know, and apart from... At nine years old going, I want to be a journalist. It kind of just happens to you. I know I know one of your big things you like to talk to people about, you know, how what drives them and what purpose they have. Yeah. And things happen to you as well. You know, like I happened to be, you know, out of work at the right time that that position came up at the radio station and, you know, it just things kind of I'm not saying happen for a reason, but, you know, it's pure chance in some ways. You know, if if that had happened to me three months before or three months after, then that radio job wouldn't have been there. Phil, you, it was You know what I mean? It's like yes, you just have to go with the flight sometimes. It was supposed to happen like that. Had you not done, you know, the first part of your career, you would not have been prepared for this radio opportunity. And sometimes I feel like we need to be forced into that next chapter in our lives because we yes. just don't know how to cut the cord, you know? Yeah, so yeah. I look at a sacking as, you know, good. <laughs> yeah. If sacking yeah. just means getting fired. <laughs> not at right? time, but yes. <laughs> right. So, I mean, not at, no one ever feels like it's great, but I'm telling you, like, 
just based on what I've seen happen to people who have, you know, been laid off or whatever. I feel like it's an adventure. What's going to happen next? That's the exciting part. I mean, I'm sure you're worried about your bills and all these things, but another door always opens. So I yeah, you just got to make the best of what you've learned. And I mean, all of us have imposter syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, thinks any minute now, everybody's going to wake up to the fact that I'm making this up as I go along. Right. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> imposter syndrome. But in actual fact, you need to, you know, sit down and not in an arrogant sort of way, but like take stock of your achievements and see what you've done and then go, yeah, I've got skills in this area. Yeah, I've learned that. I've got this kind of experience. And that's valuable. And so how can I make the most of that uh, skill that I have and, you know, take it forward and add value in another place? Absolutely. I agree. So tell us, how did you transition into the travel industry? <laughs> Again, circumstance. It's amazing. My wife went to a college and was best friends with a woman there, a woman called Annette. Whilst I was working at Channel 7, Annette was working in the newsroom. She was a production assistant in the newsroom and she and I became friends. And one day she said, listen, my uh, boyfriend's coming into town and it's his birthday. Why, why don't he come to the party? I went, yeah, sure, no worries. So I went along to the party. So I met um, this, it's a long story, stick with me. Uh, so I <laughs> met her husband, Chris, that afternoon and her best friend, Joanna, walked into the party as well. I'm married to Joanna now. It was a totally love at first sight. And I also have a small tattoo on my right shoulder, which I got that morning as well. So, you know, that was a big day. <laughs> so I became friends with Chris as well. So Annette's husband. So I became friends with him. He is the general manager of the travel insurance company that I now work for. He and his wife moved out of town a little bit and he would stay at our house one night a week. And we'd sit, you know, and chew the fat over... A dinner and a glass of wine and we were talking about his travel insurance business at one stage and we we're talking about how you can apply journalistic principles to some of the things that they wanted to do in content creation namely creating safety information to try and keep travelers safe because if you travel safely and bad things don't happen to you you're probably going to enjoy the travel more so you'll probably travel again uh, you know and <laughs> and then you know, it is a business after all. If you're going to travel again, you're probably going to buy their insurance again. So it's about creating repeat customers. Mm -hmm. So he and I, over a number of, you know, of these Tuesday nights, talked about how you could create content for, um, you know, around travel insurance and what you do and how you do it. And he took these proposals to his board and they said they're fantastic ideas. And he said they're not all mine. Some of them come from my mate Phil Sylvester. And they said, well, we better employ him then. So he then came to me and said, you know, we love those things that we've talked about. Would you like to come and do it at World Nomads? And I said, shit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this Who doesn't want to work for a travel company. Was this while you were at the radio station? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So um, I'd, uh, one of the things that World Nomads had done and my first involvement with them a number of years prior to that, they um, they have a they have a uh, charitable arm called the Footprints Network, and what happens when you purchase World Nomads Travel Insurance? You can at the in the purchase point in the purchase path, you can you get us. Would you like to add two dollars to your insurance policy, and it will go towards? And there are three community-based projects um, which are offered to you. You can help rebuild this school in Nepal. You can help uh, provide solar lanterns for villages in Peru, or you can help train teachers in Vietnam or whatever it was. So they'd been funding these projects for a while. And then they, they decided, you know, we should go and film one of them. We should send a film crew along. And uh, one of the projects they picked was uh, rebuilding the school in a very remote area of Nepal, where uh, just think about filming a documentary in a remote village in Nepal, how are you going to charge the batteries for the camera? Because they don't have electricity all day. They don't have, you know, it's not powered. You have to make sure you have access to a generator. So I worked with World Nomads and the, and the, uh, and the 
uh, filmmaker that they were going to send about how would you manage all those logistical things and then also how are we going to shoot this how because of my television experience is going how do i know what to shoot and you know so i talked him through all of that and i said Oh, mate, when you're in Kathmandu, get some beauty shots, you know, because Kathmandu is beautiful. Go get some of the temples and what have you. And I said, oh, mate, there'll be a flea-bitten dog sleeping in the sun somewhere. So, you know, as an example of beauty shots to use. <laughs> and, of course, when he came back a few months later <laughs> in, the, in the finished documentary, there's a flea-bitten dog sleeping in the oh sun under God. a temple in Kathmandu, just as I predicted. <laughs> <laughs> Your predictions are always on point. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and the, the the filmmaker that we sent there, here's a connection that people will appreciate. His name is uh, Trent O'Donnell, and he went uh, – I'm not sure if he's still in the United States, but he went to um, L.A., and he was the director on one of the later series of the uh, Zoe Deschanel show, uh, show. What was that one? Um, Girl Show. I'll remember the name of it in a moment. But, it, you know, he you know shot a few um, uh, comedy series in the States. So, mm. And one of the first things he did was go and shoot this documentary for World Nomads in Nepal. Wow. Okay. So you get this job offer. You take it because you love travel, right? No? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Okay. And it was also, you know, the interwebs was exploding. <laughs> Mm. I'm talking nine years ago, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, we're into Web 2.0 and it's quite clear that um, at this stage that traditional media is uh, being challenged by digital media and new media. And you could see, uh, you know, uh, you can see things like uh, BuzzFeed and what have you are really starting to take over. And there was a lot of discussion about how long can traditional television last and, you know, like the nightly one hour long bulletin, is that really going to exist in, you know, a dozen years from now when people are able to get their news from all sorts of live sources from bloggers and video journalists. So I could kind of see the writing on the wall as well. So when somebody said, come and work for us over in this digital space at this e-commerce business, the what I said to uh, the founder uh, who uh, employed me, a fellow called Simon Monk, I said, I will teach you everything I know from journalism about creating content if you teach me everything you know about e-commerce and digital marketing. Mm. And I went, yep, deal, that's it. So, you know, I went in there and created all this content for them. And having created content, they said, well, now you better learn how to market the content because we're a digital marketing company. And this is in, I'm talking nine years ago, when content marketing, that, that term content marketing was only just starting to emerge. Um, you know, it was still digital publishing or something in those days. Um, so content marketing was a very new thing. Uh, not a lot of companies were doing it. And we were in the position to be at the forefront of that. Uh, so I, you know, I went along to Content Marketing World and a few things like that and uh, and came back and made some proposals and said, okay, if this is, this is what we want to do, then this is how we market our content. So I ended up becoming, from content creator, I became a digital marketer and a content marketer and uh, we started making more videos and we started integrating that into there as well. Yeah, so, you know, it was, a, I could see that it was, even though I was, you know, a bit of a veteran from mainstream uh, news and mainstream media, that there was some fantastic opportunities. And and let's face it, it looked really exciting. It was different, it was something new to learn, and it looked exciting. And I went, yeah, yeah, I'm up for that. Let's have a go. So as someone from mainstream, you know, television and 20 years ago being, you know, in broadcasting and all of that, and yep. coming into this, this change where we have, you know, this social media, digital marketing and all this other stuff. What do you love about the new age of things? And what do you not love about it? I love what we're doing right now. And that's being on a podcast. It's like the democratization of broadcast. Uh, it's fantastic. I mean, you know, for under a thousand bucks, you can set yourself up with professional sounding uh 
um, you know, radio equipment and create a podcast. And we've done exactly that as well. The World Nomads podcast, and we love talking about travel there as well. And the fact that you don't need, you know, a transmitter and a license from a government and all that investment and that anybody can have a go. And as a result, there is so much fantastic content out there. There's, you know, you, people are interesting. Mm, people have mm. got things to say and now they've got a way to say it. So I really like that. And I and and I feel kind of the same way about social media as well. It's like lots of people uh, have got lots of great things to say. And now, you know, you've got Muckrack, uh, uh, Medium, all of these platforms now where um, people can um, – they can share their opinions about things and they can share their skills and they can share their knowledge. Um, it's just that is what I love about digital marketing and, and the digital space. What I don't like about it, of course, is that everybody's opinion had kind of carries the same weight, even the idiots. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even the ones with something bad to say or something stupid to say get get to be you know, part of it too. But look, you know, like I, um, um, I always forget which philosopher said it. I think it was Rousseau, but it could, somebody will pick me up and tell me if I'm wrong about this. But it was, you know, that whole, I don't agree with your opinion, but I will fight to the death for your right to say it. Mm. So I've always believed that. And I know there's a lot of talk these days about you can't say that, you need to shut that down. My argument is, well, yeah, there's a lot of bad things being said and a lot of hurtful things being said, but you're not going to stop that by just shutting them down. The The way you're going to correct that is by listening to what they have to say and engaging with them and telling them the other side, by telling them the truth, by giving them another perspective. And sometimes, you know, you have to do that one person at a time. You have to go, I hear what you're saying, but here's why I think you're wrong. And if you can come up with a, this is the journalist in me, if you can come up with the facts and a reasoned argument, you can you can turn somebody around. We were talking to Daniel Scheffler, uh, who's a travel writer and has just launched uh, an iHeartRadio travel podcast as well. And we had him on our own podcast recently. He's a gay New York man. And his rule is thou shalt talk to strangers. So wherever you go, the beauty of, of travel is the fact that you meet people and you talk to them and you engage with them and you get their opinion. And he said, you don't have to agree with everybody, but it's interesting to get their opinion. And he said he was on a particular flight in the United States and he was seated next to somebody from the Deep South wearing a um, MAGA hat. And, you know, New York gay man next to a man from the South wearing a MAGA hat. He's gone, mm. okay, <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Right. And and so he started his conversation. He followed his own his own rule. And, and as Daniel told us, he said, look, we didn't agree on things, but we didn't shout and fight and argue. And he said, and, and Daniel said, I was possibly, uh, Daniel said that the man in the MAGA hat said to him that Daniel was the first gay man he had ever spoken to. To which we said, wow. no, it's not, mate. You just don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but the, he was saying that you are the first, you know, gay person that I know I've spoken to. And they ended up, you know, disagreeing on lots of things, but parted on friendly terms. Now, you know, Mr. Maga Hat now probably has a very different opinion uh, about homosexuality and gays and even people from New York. Right. Uh, you know, because he was engaged and he heard the other side. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. So what I what I love about the digital space is the, the democracy of it. What I hate about it is some of the really bad things that I said. But I don't I don't see that. I think I think there's still opportunity in that. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about travel. And Please. let's talk about travel insurance. Let's start there. So ex okay. explain to people what travel insurance is. Okay. It is, you're really happy to get auto insurance in case your car is involved in a collision. You're really happy to get home insurance in case there's a fire at home. But you don't plan on these things happening. Mm -hmm. And you never see it coming, right? Okay. So when you travel, 
things happen as well. So you and you could be left out of pocket by these things. You could be hit with big bills um, and travel insurance is there to make sure that you are as much as possible not financially disadvantaged by unforeseen circumstances. Now, in the US, you guys are used to buying, you know, like trip protection, which is basically, um, you know, cancellation and delay coverage, and then medical insurance in case you get hospitalised and whilst you're overseas, and then, uh, you know, theft protection. You guys are quite used to buying those products separately. But the product that is called travel insurance kind of wraps all those th three things up. In fact, they are the three things that travel insurance does. Covers you for cancellation and delay, covers you for uh, loss or damage to personal belongings, and covers you for medical expenses. That's it. Um, and so that is all wrapped up in one neat little package so that you're not dealing with multiple agencies when you when you when something does go wrong, you're dealing with the one agency. And you know, it's what's different about World Nomads about it as well, and why we call ourselves a travel lifestyle brand is that um I mean, we we are all travellers. We love travel. We believe in travel. We believe travel is a for a, a force for positive change in the world because of the "thou shalt talk to strangers" kind of philosophy. When you travel, you you become a better person. The people you meet become better people. And if you travel in the right way, if you travel, you know, sustainably and responsibly, you can leave the world a, a better place than when you found it. So. You know, and part of that is you have a uh, responsibility to yourself to protect yourself in case something goes wrong. Um, and that responsibility um, extends to your family as well. If you are if you are injured, we've just had a case uh, quite recently. If you are injured uh, overseas and you need acute medical care, those bills, even in, you know, cheap countries in Southeast Asia, those bills will rack up because, you know, health, world-class health care to keep you alive is expensive everywhere. So your bills are going to rack up and then maybe we need to get you back home. So, you know, there's an air ambulance involved. You can very easily end up with a, you know, $100,000 uh, bill for something that happens to you. So if you're not insured, and we know this, we know people have to sell their houses mums mums and dads have to remortgage their houses to pay those bills so you have a responsibility to yourself to look after yourself but you've also got a responsibility to your family and loved ones to look after yourself while you travel so travel but make sure you're protected with travel insurance so what kind of travel insurance should we be getting so like when i book a flight depending on where i'm going and how much the flight costs i usually take the insurance just in case I need to cancel or something happens so that I can get my money back. Um, what kind of insurance should people be looking at? Is that one type of insurance? Is it like a bigger thing that would be like if you're going overseas and you need medical, like additional medical? What kind of plans? Okay, there were about nine things in there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Let me. Let me. Let me. Okay, let me break start, it down. Can a I little. start at number one? Okay. Yes. Cancellation insurance, unless you have got cancel for any reason insurance, which is quite expensive. But cancellation insurance is if your trip, flight, booking is cancelled on you, not if you want to cancel it. If it gets cancelled, so you know how you pay that ten percent non-refundable deposit on a you know hotel or a tour or, or mm -hmm. an airline ticket mm -hmm. if that if that service does not go ahead it gets cancelled for some reason then you're going to lose that 10 percent non-refundable deposit that you've paid that's what travel insurance covered we get you that other 10 percent back so that you're not out of pocket and that could be because you know we've got one happening at the moment you know there's a hurricane coming through heading towards Florida. Maybe, you know, you've booked for the Labor Day weekend, you've booked a, a vacation in Florida, and now your hotel says to you, sorry, we're shutting up shop. We're, you know, boarding up the, the hotel, um, not available. It's because of the weather, uh, we're not refunding your deposit. If you bought your travel insurance before the hurricane was named, 
then that would be covered. We would get that 10% back for you. We'd pay that for you. Same goes, you know, the cruise ship in hurricanes and things like that. But the advantage of travel insurance as opposed to that trip protection, you're actually covered before you travel as well. So if you have, you know, put paid all these deposits, you've paid all this money for flights and hotels and tours, and then two weeks out, you break your leg so you can't go. So then you have to ring up the airline and the hotel and the tour provider and go, sorry, can't come, I've got a broken leg. And they go, yeah, sure, no problem. And they keep your 10% deposit. We cover that. If you've bought your insurance before you've broken your leg, we cover that. So you will get that back. Now, it doesn't mean you get to go on your trip and you're disappointed and all those sorts of things. But financially, you're going to be back at zero. You're not going to be out of pocket. That's So, yeah, trip... trip you know, trip protection when you're at, at the airport and you're, or you add it to your ticket, yeah, sure, that will cover you for certain things. But a travel insurance policy will cover you for all of those things at once. And as soon as you've bought the policy, there are things that are covered leading up to the time you leave, so pre-departure things. And that, you know, and it's not just you breaking your leg. Like, you know, um, a, a family, a close family member becomes ill and you go, I've got to stay and look after them, you know then that's well, there's a whole stack of reasons in our, in our policies uh, about why you can um, access the cancellation uh, benefit. Okay. So how much should travel insurance cost? Is there like a minimum price to maximum? Like, is there any price that if you, if someone tells you that the policy is this much, like they should run? Uh Traditionally in the States, um, insurance policies have been calculated as a percentage of the cost of your trip. So it'd be, uh, it's going to cost you 20, really the value of your trip is going to cost you 20%, add 20% on top for insurance. Okay. Um, so be aware of whether somebody's charging 15% or 25% for that. But the way travel insurance tends to work in the rest of the world and is now starting to be much, much more common in the United States as well. And it's certainly the way that World Nomads works. The The premium that you pay for it is defined by the maximum benefit available. So we go, you know, up to five million for medical uh, emergencies, up to fifteen hundred dollars for, um, you know, belongings up to blah, 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 blah. So we have you know, these maximum benefits that are set. And then that is used to determine what the premium is. So if you are going on a trip and you are going super luxury and it's a $20,000 trip, doesn't matter because the, the premium will be the same as if you're going on a $2,000 trip because the premium is defined by the maximum benefit available, and which is a much fairer way of determining uh, how you travel. And this is because basically the same things happen to people in the same way. So, you know, we can kind of determine what happens. Well, put it this way, our, you know, for a two, two week vacation somewhere, our policies are around about, and don't hold me, this depends where you're going, how old you are, how long you're going for, but around about $200 for a couple of weeks. Uh, and it won't vary that much from there. Um, you know, obviously the longer you go, the more it costs and what have you, but around about 200 bucks, whether you're going on a $2,000 trip or a $20,000 trip, 200 bucks. Hmm, okay. Um, so when you book insurance, do you have to book that with the travel agent that you used? Or let's say you booked a trip on your own. You went online and found this amazing vacation. You booked it through this, I don't know, travel package deal, whatever. Can I call up um, anyone and get a travel insurance plan to go to cover me on this trip? Or do I have to have some type of is does there have to be any association with the agency and where you booked or? No, nope, not at all. Worldnomads.com. And you can go on there online and sign up yourself. We don't need many questions from you it's really simple to do we make it as easy as possible have your credit card handy with you and it is done yes you can go through travel agents and uh, airlines who sell travel insurance other people who sell travel insurance as an add-on and in this i'm even including your credit card travel insurance here the agents those 
third party providers, those, you know, middle people, they can get something like a commission of 50%. Mm -hmm. on, so that means that the premium you pay has to be more expensive to cover the commission that they make. So you will find it uh, the same or similar insurance direct online through places like worldnomads.com for significantly less than you will get them from um, an agent. Now, if you go to a travel agent and they go, actually, they are offering me one which is around about the same price, then you need to compare the insurance policies because the way you keep down the premium on an insurance policy is by offering lower ultimate benefits, if you know what I mean. It's like the maximum benefit that you can be paid out. If you lower that, then, of course, the premium becomes cheaper. So if somebody, if you suspect somebody's getting a commission for selling you a travel insurance policy and it seems cheap, you want to read exactly what is covered and what is not covered by that policy because they're doing it by scrimping on some of those things. So, you know, if next time you uh, book a vacation and they say, would you like to include travel insurance in that? Say, no, thanks. I'd like to go get it myself. Uh, you don't have to connect it at all, um, and we don't. We don't. The qu we don't ask many questions. We want to know um, your age, where you're going, and how long for. That's it. I uh, and you know you, there are a few other things like if you have a what we call a pre-existing medical condition, you better you know tell us about that as well. But that's all we know. So I, we don't care whether you're staying in you know luxury accommodation or backpacking. We. How old are you? Where are you going? How long for? And so you guys are in Australia. I'm in New Jersey, New York, the United yep. States. So I could, I mean, New Jersey, New York. What the hell? Well, I'm in I'm New not, Jersey. I know. <laughs> I've got. <laughs> but um, we're, we're a global company. We sell to, we sell policies in over 130 different uh, countries. Okay. So you don't need to go into a physical office. You can do it online. Worldnomads.com is our global. We also have worldnomads.com.au in Australia, you know, .co.uk. There are localised versions of it as well, but .com is the global brand. Um, and, yes, we're based in Australia, but we spell everything with American spelling. <laughs> because, you know, .com is you guys. So. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> as a journalist, you know, as a journalist, when I have to put Zs in instead of Ss, I need to take a shower afterwards, but, you know. <laughs> We got we got an American girl that works for us, and she's been in Australia for a long time. She's gone. How do you guys think I have felt for the last ten years? Oh my <laughs> Putting God. S's instead of Z's. Oh yeah, right. Oh, we get it. So um, yeah, no, just go online and do it. We're a global company. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about trip safety, travel safety. So why did you sure. th why do you think people need to be educated about travel safety? You would think that this is common sense, but it's not. So tell us what your thoughts are around that. Well, you know, common sense, it's not that common, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Facts, it's not. Look, uh, okay, when we when we decided to create the safety section, the safety blog, it was um I mean, when you when you travel to 50 countries, and you're an experienced traveler, you kind of know what to expect. But if you go to a place for the first time or you're not a very experienced traveler, or even if you are an experienced traveler and you've never been to a place, it's go, well, what what am I going to encounter here? What are the common things that I'm going to bump into here? And they're not always the same in every country. When I first started at World Nomads, they had uh, some safety content that they um, – licensed from a kidnap and ransom and business travel company and what and i kid you not they had this story uh on the front page of the safety blog and the title of it was something like uh international implications for transnational terrorism due to tuareg rebellion in sub-saharan africa like that was the title okay and i said okay well if we're going to have a traveler focus uh and we're going to talk about safety for travellers. Let's just change the title of that story to, can I go to that music festival in Mali? Which is what it was all about. It's like, seriously, as a traveller, can you go to that music festival in Mali? Or are the, it is the tu Tuareg rebellion, you know, terrorism there too much? And then we said, okay, well, let's have a look at all the popular countries that people go to. And because we're, you know, we've got an, an adventure bent, 
um, you know, we we have people going to some pretty fantastic destinations. And it's like, well, let's have a look at each country and go, what are the five or six things that are peculiar to that country that pose a threat to you? And let's write about them. So that means you have to find people who know the destination. So people who live there or who are, you know, recently been there or are expats. And you need to get a little bit below the, you know, always keep your passport on an inside pocket. You have to get really practical information. So it's like, don't get on the number 43 bus from Rome Termini station down to uh, the forum because it's always full of uh, pickpockets. So that's the kind of information that we have on there. Um, uh, you know, it's, yes, some health information, but we try to get as specific as possible uh, for each destination and the things you might encounter there. Like, um, it's a, a very common scam in uh, Budapest and uh, and Prague as well. You go in and you order some beers and without checking the menu. Uh, properly and then you'll get a bill and they've been serving you you know two hundred dollar beers instead of two dollar beers uh, and you get you know a standover man comes and says okay you know i was you know six hundred dollars before you can leave this bar and it's quite a common scam and if you know about it when you go in it's you go no show me the menu i'm having the two dollar beer thank you very much oh, so if man. you know about it you can protect yourself ahead that of is crazy oh yeah i know I know. So, so, okay. So you guys write up articles and you have yep. like all this good information for different destinations, like what to look out for. Yep. As specific as we can get from locals who know. Right. Oh my goodness. I, that's crazy. I didn't know that it was that deep. Yeah. So, you know, like you arrive in a place and if you've read our content before you get there, you are, you know, an instant globetrotter. You're an instant seasoned traveler and you're aware of all these things. And, you know, like you're just kind of uh, prepared for stuff. So, like, you walk into a bar and go, oh, I better make sure I'm having the $2 beer, not the $200 beer. Right. It doesn't ruin your trip. You're just aware. You're just a savvy traveler. I was in, um, I was in Belgrade. Uh, a couple of years back, I went there for a conference and uh, booked into my hotel, went down to the concierge desk and I had a you know free afternoon and I said, okay, I'm going to go take a walk around Belgrade, the old city, Belgrade. So I said to the concierge, any part of town I shouldn't go to, anywhere I should stay away from, anything I should look out for, you know, how do I stay safe? And he said, no, no, it's a very safe town. You're right. You can go anywhere you like. But don't get in the fake taxis. And I went, okay, how do you tell which taxi's fake? And he said they have a, you know, white taxi sign on the roof, but it's plain white. The official taxis have the same, you know, m plastic module on the roof, but they have like the company crest on it, like a company badge on it. So if they don't have the company badge on it, it's a fake taxi. Don't get in it. I went, okay. A uh, couple of nights later... <laughs> We, uh, some of the uh, conference delegates went out and had a meeting at night. Yes, <laughs> we went out drinking, right? <laughs> mm. Stumble out of this bar and, you know, uh, uh, pile into two taxis. And as we get in, uh, one of my colleagues says to me, these are fake taxis. And I've got, oh, okay. Everybody out, everybody out. But everybody was very raucous and, and they are going, righto. So the taxi driver had the music turned up like really, really loud. So I just tapped him. I'm in the back. I tapped him on the shoulder and I went, I know what type of taxi this is. I know I've seen, you know, I know this is a white taxi. Turn the music down and put the meter on. And he's got, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I left the music up. And I went, no, 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 no. Listen to me. Turn the music down and put on the meter. And he's got, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no worries. And he drives us back to our hotel. And I know this is like a, you know, 250 dinar trip because I've done it a few times in the, in the, days preceding he doesn't take us to the front door of the hotel because there's a uh, a barrier there a boom gate that only lets official taxis in so he takes us to the side entrance and we go oh no you know here we go and as we pull up i'm watching and he presses the stop button on the meter and it jumped from 250 dinar to like seven thousand. 
<laughs> so I looked at him and I said, mate, I watched you do that. I, did, I saw that. I told you when I got in, I know what type of cab this is. And I just saw you. I just saw what you did. There is no way I'm paying that. Here's your 250 and he's like, oh, no, no, there it is on the meter. I'm going, mate, it did not come down in the last rain shower. Here's your 250 I know that's what the trip costs. And he's reluctantly accepted the money from, from me. Meanwhile, the taxi in front with my other friends, they're having the same argument with this guy. And I don't know if you know Serbians. You know, like, they're really good at basketball because they're, like, huge. All right? <laughs> this... The ca- the cab in front, this driver gets out and he's like a mountain. <laughs> he's like, he's at least twice as big as any of us and we're drunk, you know, so it's not going to go well. Oh and he God. walks over to my cab and says to the other taxi driver, he's, he's gone, and he's saying to my friend, see, they all pay the same, they pay the same. And he turns to the taxi driver, how much they pay you? <laughs> and my taxi driver drops his head in shame and goes, 250 <laughs> mm, mm. other taxi driver cracks it has you know gets really angry storms off gets in his car and he's about to race away and my friend is like trying to give him the 250 dinos because we don't know what happens if you don't pay a fare right you know just police then turn up and say you didn't pay your fare so we ended up throwing 250 dinars in his open window but as he's taxi raced off the money came flying back out again so <laughs> wow but you know that's how you like if, if it's not on worldnomads.com ask the concierge you know ask the hostel receptions like what do i have to be careful of in this town okay so tip number one guys when going to another country <laughs> you should always ask questions at the front desk about oh how to stay safe what should you look out for what should you be aware of are there certain taxis that you should avoid are there certain areas that you should avoid things like where that. where is the wrong side of the tracks is the right. question you're going to ask right where is the wrong side of the tracks that is so crazy but there's a scam everywhere. So what was the what would you say is the worst trip that you've ever been on? The scary. OK, I thought my number was up once. Uh, this was a long time ago before I was a travel safety expert. And uh, I was in Sicily and my girlfriend at the time was a very pretty blonde, blue eyed girl. And stupidly, we were waiting for a bus and these guys pulled up and said, where are you going? And so we said, and they were, oh, we'll give you a lift. Uh, and then a stupid, stupid, stupid thing to do. They drove up a, a back road, not where we wanted to go, and it was quite clear uh, what their intentions were for my girlfriend. And it was like uh, that moment where – and they, they were both big guys as well, and there were two of them. And I, it was that moment where I've gone, okay, we're probably going to die here, but I'm not going to go without a fight. So I stepped in between one of the guys who was attempting to assault my girlfriend. He was just starting to get a bit hand grabby and handsy. So I stepped in and he was like twice my size. Uh, so I stepped in between and made it clear that it wasn't going to happen unless they took me out first. And thankfully, the other guy in that party, he's like gone, nah, not worth it. Grabbed his mate, pushed him in the car and they drove away and left us stranded up this dirt road somewhere but that was the worst thing that ever happened to me i thought you know fate worse than death was about to happen to my girlfriend and i had resigned myself to either getting seriously injured or possibly killed trying to make sure it doesn't happen right oh my god tip number two do not take rides from strangers yep ever <laughs> yep that is so really dumb. scary and, you know, yeah. sometimes people just when they're on vacation, you just for some reason, your common sense just goes out the window and you think, oh, I'm on vacation. I'm safe. This is fine. You know, That's right. you know, you really sometimes. Well, let me tell you something, um, Phil. I'm black yeah. and black people. <laughs> we do not. We do not take rides from strangers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we don't play that. <laughs> yeah, we don't. <laughs> When there's a scary movie, if there's a black person in that scary movie, um, 
and there's a noise (laughs) there's a noise out there they are not going to check they're like listen i'm getting my bag i'm leaving (laughs) i'm now looking for this trope in every movie i watch okay (laughs) we might be the first to go but we were going we're going because we were on our way out (laughs) right we're not checking it out anything so I would yeah. never, you know, I'm I'm very scary like that. I'm like, that's why I told you I'm scary. I don't, mm oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. But let's play a game. This is called the Oh Hell No, Oh Hell Yes game. I'm going to ask okay. you a question and you tell me if this is an Oh Hell No or Oh Hell Yes. Okay. Can What's what's your language warning on this podcast? Because I can answer in the Australian way if you want. Oh, you can do whatever. This is mine. Shit, is... yeah, or shit, no. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, I'll stick with yours. Come on, let's go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, drive to and from the airport on your own at at a destination that you have never been to. Is that a oh hell no or oh hell yes or shit no shit yes? <laughs> <laughs> or the other uh, the other Aussie version? Yeah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nah. <laughs> yeah, nah. Uh, hell no. Hell no. Okay. Oh, well, how do you know where you're going? You've just landed in country. You're probably jet lagged and tired. You know, either get a taxi or better still get the airport shuttle. They are amazing. They're really good. They always take you where you want to go and they're cheap and, you know, you've, you've helped reduce traffic congestion and, you know, been good to the planet by not driving on your own in a car. Exactly. Don't be a dummy. But some people, they want to be, oh, frugal. Oh, let's just rent a car and we'll just drive around and, you know, we'll just. D- 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 no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, number two, leave yeah. resort alone in a taxi to go out into the town. Oh, hell yes. Or oh, hell no. Or oh, oh hell, hell maybe. maybe. Oh, oh, hell, hell maybe. maybe. We said it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hell yes. So, I'm going yes on that one. And that because it's, that's exactly what I did when I was in Belgrade. I left the resort hotel on my own and walked around town. But I checked with the concierge before I went. So how are you going to meet, you know, people from Belgrade if you don't go into Belgrade? If you stay in the hotel with other people, other delegates that come for the conference, I could have talked to them back home. I'm going to go. I'm going to go out and meet the people. Okay, but when you're out meeting the people, what yep. are some safety tips? One, you check with the concierge and ask about, you know, what goes on around here. Sure. Two, you don't get in yep. cars with strangers. Yeah. Three, what's number three? I don't know. Tell me, Phil. Stay situationally aware. You know, like, just like be aware. Like, if you think the person that you are talking to right now is not genuine, if your gut feeling is this is, you know, this is not good. You're right. It's not good. Get away. Go away. Excuse yourself. Say, sorry, I've got to go. Walk away. Oh. Trust your gut. Trust yes. your gut. Yeah. It's like, it's, you know, like, don't don't let your brain take a holiday when you take a holiday. You know, don't, don't let your brain go on vacation. Keep a little bit of that switched on. Not to be, you know, not to the point that where you won't engage with strangers, but, you know, like, am I in a... Would I do this at home? Is this a good situation to be in at home? Hell yes, hell no. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sleep with your balcony door unlocked. Oh, hell no or oh, hell yes. I don't even do that at home. Okay, me neither. I'm, I forget, Phil, hell no. I'm so I've, glad you I've, said I've that. Had somebody in my, I've had somebody in my house. What? Yeah. I, uh, I, this is... 20 years ago now, and Joe, my wife, my girlfriend then, uh, and I was living in a share house. So Joe was there, and there was a couple other people we shared the house with. They were all asleep in bed, so I've gone up and I've gone for an early morning run. And as I come back with my newspapers, uh, you'll love this bit too. When I come back, I'm carrying, you know, the day's newspapers, and I walk into my backyard, and there is uh, a young guy coming out of my back door, out of my kitchen, with one of my kitchen knives in his hand. Oh, my gosh. And I'm blocking his exit because I've gone up some stairs onto, you know, the back veranda. So I'm blocking his exit, and it's like he's got my carving knife. So <laughs> so I held the newspapers in front of me. I've got two, you know, pretty thick national newspapers in front of me because the pen is mightier than the sword. <laughs> really? <laughs> 
There's, there's no way he's going to stab me through two newspapers. Okay. So I'm using them as a shield. All right. The pen is mightier than the sword. But I just said to him, okay, stay calm. I'm moving aside. You can F off. And um, off he did. But he'd been into the house and he'd taken money out of people's uh, wallets, like, out of my wife's handbag, which is on next to her on the floor next to the bed. So he'd been right through the house. So I don't leave my balcony unlocked at home. I certainly wouldn't do it while I'm away. Thank you. So people, when you're on vacation and you're getting all tipsy <laughs> and stuff, okay, lock your damn balcony door before you go to bed. Don't be a fool. All right. Party with the hotel staff. Oh, hell no. Or oh, hell yes. Oh, hell yes. No, Phil. No, damn it. It could yes. be a setup. <laughs> no, they're all locals. I mean, oh, oh, yeah, okay. It can be a setup. But if it's genuine, you know, like you've, you know, the, the bar's closed and they're having a quiet drink and you bump into it and they're partying on, they're locals. Talk to them. They'll tell you all the good places to go, the good things to see. Okay, so talk this is an oh hell shout, maybe. Shout, talk to strangers. Oh, this is an oh hell maybe for me. I, okay. I I defer to the gut. You have to trust your gut on this because, you know, some people are sketchy and they pretend to be nice and they might be trying to set you up. And then other people are very nice and. Hey Nicole, hey Nicole I've seen I've seen your picture. Okay. I've seen I've seen what you look like. Okay, I'm pretty sure you tried. They try to pick you up all the time, right? <laughs> so you do have to trust your gut on that one. Okay? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> take okay. Take a ride home from a local. We we already established that this is an old yeah, home. No, now. hell no. Yeah, so don't do this. Yep, don't do that. And then my last one is drink from the mini bar. So have you heard the stories of, that have been coming out of Dominican Republic? Yep, I have. And I think I know what that is. Okay. And I can tell you about that one if you want. Yes. Okay. Here's my theory. Because we've had quite a number of claims, and they're unusual. People go, I've been, I've been poisoned, alcohol poisoning. I've been, you know, my drink's been spiked. I've been poisoned in, it's happened a, a fair bit in uh, Bali in Indonesia and other islands around Indonesia. So I started investigating it and we have a very serious case. There was a young uh, Australian traveler. She was a nurse and she was actually um, alcohol poisoning, but she'd, uh, she'd gone blind from it. And I went, okay, so that's not alcohol, that's methanol. Methanol is what makes you go blind. And I discovered that when you are, if you are distilling alcohol, if you, at a certain point in the process, if you get the temperature control wrong by about one or two degrees, you don't make alcohol, you make methanol. So I go, okay, so why would somebody be using a backyard still to make alcohol? There is traditionally in parts of Indonesia, especially Bali, there's a drink called arak, which is rice wine, distilled rice wine, basically. And it was made by... Um, religious leaders as part of uh, not only of a religious ceremony, it was used in a religious ceremony, but it's also quite a popular drink there as well. But it was made by, you know, old guys who know what they're doing. Now you've got this massive tourist industry where people are, you know, going to nightclubs and they're drinking spirits and uh, the bar owners are always looking at maximising profit. So they are, you know, getting name label alcohol behind the bar, but they're mixing it with stuff they're making themselves in the backyard and they're not doing it right. And they're putting methanol in the drinks instead of alcohol. And I think the same thing has been happening in the Dominican Republic. I've got a second theory about it as well. I think if people say it was after I drank from the mini bar, I suspect that there is a illegal alcohol production business somewhere in the DR and they're getting it wrong and they're poisoning people with methanol. The other theory I've heard about this and this comes from a guy called Burke Files. I don't know if Burke's listening, but if you are, this is totally yours and I'm stealing it. Uh, he's a uh, he's a private investigator and does a lot of uh, financial fraud investigation, but he's, you know, like FBI trained or something like that. And he, he suspects that what's happening is they are using 
because uh, you know some of these people in DR haven't haven't drunk out of the mini bar, but they get sick anyway. So you go, mm-hmm. what? He suspects that what's happening is that the hotel, some of the hotels are trying to treat bed bugs by using pesticides which are not meant for indoors. They're garden pesticides. Mm. So they're finding bed bug in infestations and then using really strong pesticides which wow. even you know contact on your skin will make you sick he said they're either deliberately fumigating the rooms with the wrong stuff because of bed bugs or they're not allowing proper proper ventilation and they may even be putting this stuff uh, on the on the plants around the entrance you know to the rooms and people are coming in contact with it when they brush against plants but his theory is that it's organophosphate pesticides mm, that is there you go. so scary listen i know i, I love and, Dominic- and, you know, and that's always about that you know like they got bed bugs they can't you know they can't have bed bugs and somebody and i'm sure it's well i hope it's not sanctioned by the you know management but somebody's like gone what's this oh yeah that'll kill them let's spray that on it you you got to be more like responsible when you have a business and you have people coming in and out and st- like I just don't understand that. It it really boggles my mind how people can cut corners when they have, you know, a business where people are spending money to come and relax and get away and then people are dying and they're getting sick and it's just really sad. I yeah, love you know, Dominican okay. Republic, but all of those news reports, I, I'm sorry, I, I, will, I will never go back. That's a bit harsh. Okay? I know. I'm very harsh, Phil. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm, I, uh. My life is worth more than a thrill, a cheap thrill in Dominican Republic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry. I've been yeah. there a couple times. I've had my fun. It's time to move on. Okay. I get that. I mean, and everybody has to make the right decision for themselves about what level of risk they're prepared to accept some people are you know macgyver and take risk very lightly and know how to deal with it some people are very risk averse and that may be because you know i've got responsibilities at home i can't you know right take that risk and the thing is that see that's another thing that's good about social media And that's not so good about social media, right? Because social media, you get to see all of these things that you wouldn't necessarily see if we we didn't have this instant look at everything. But then things can be fabricated, twisted. And you know what I mean? Like I saw this girl had a video of... um, there was a cup she was mixing and it she said this is supposed to be alcohol and she was mixing it and the spoon was melting (laughs) i'm so serious and she was like what is this what are they putting in these drinks like where and i don't know where they got that from and they're insinuating that this is what they're putting in drinks you know and you have to be careful so now that's freaking me out and i'm like oh my god i can't even go on vacation and have a drink like i have to be concerned it's scary. Yeah, it, yeah. I know it's difficult, especially you know, like drink. You know, people putting rehypnol in drinks and what have you to try and uh, sexually assault you and what have you. You should never leave a drink uncovered somewhere. You should always try and watch the bartender pour it for you. But now it's getting to the point where I can't even trust that name label bottle of spirits you've got behind the bar. Right. I don't know that. Yeah. So, but there is a there is an answer to that. Drink wine. <laughs> mm. Yeah, you know. Drink wine. I know. Yeah, you know. Um, it's yeah. it, it is getting hard. Um, but uh, you know, buy your duty free on the way in, and take your own bottle to the bar and go. That's mine. Pull my drinks from that one, please. Yeah. I don't know. Right. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, do you guys publish a list of like the safest to most dangerous places to go, or do you? have anything like that or do you think that everywhere is dangerous you just got to be careful well no because it depends on what type of traveler you are if you're um scary cane of coal and uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> you you will consider something you know to be dangerous that maybe i don't because you and i have disagreed on a couple of things about what's dangerous <laughs> or not so you know it's like i'll mention macgyver you know like if you're macgyver you're 
you don't think anywhere's dangerous. <laughs> right. But if you're a first time traveller and you've you know never been out of your home county, then everything probably seems dangerous to you. But stand in your kitchen and have a look around. Crikey, look at all those sharp knives over there. This is a dangerous place. You know. Yeah. Danger is subjective. It depends who you are, how experienced you are and how you how well you're prepared you are and how you tackle it. So we don't publish a list of uh, two dangerous places. But we do publish a lot of advice on this place is really sketchy, so make sure you're well prepared for this one. You know, we, we, we tell it like it is. And, you know, if you're you're not as, as experienced as other travellers, then don't go there. But as I said, that is up to each person to make their own decision about the level of risk they prepare to accept. Awesome. Okay. Well, this is the Oh Hell No podcast. So I always ask my guests to share an Oh Hell No moment that they've experienced on their journey, right? And I know we have Oh Hell No moments all the time. So share an Oh Hell No moment with us that has taught you something or changed your perspective on something. And it could be personal, it could be work related, it could be a positive Oh Hell No moment, or it could be a negative Oh Hell No moment. Oh, they happen all the time, don't they? I know, they do. So you should have oh, a lot. fantastic. <laughs> uh, here's a work one, and it's kind of a positive one. And, you know, for people who are into creating their own content and podcasts and blogging and what have you, the place that your content is the least likely to be seen is on your own website. So make sure that you share it and you get other people to share it. So spread the word. So there's a, there's a good work one for you. Uh, oh, hell no, no moment that changed my perspective on life. And it's a bit of a cliche, I'm sorry, but the, the birth of my children, mm -hmm. especially the first one, okay, that changes things big time. That's like, oh, now I get it. <laughs> okay, this is, and you know, and like, I'm a guy, right? Yeah. You know, like my wife had, you know, all the books. Did I read one? No, no guy reads those books. Mm -mm. But you know, and she's like, oh, but you've got to get ready. You've got to get ready. I'm, yeah, 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 be, yeah, be fine, be fine, fine. But this, you know, it, maybe it goes back to your caveman thing. I don't know. But the moment you see a head appearing, <laughs> you're ready. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of okay, surreal. Okay, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is an oh hell no. Moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, Phil, it was such a pleasure having you on this podcast. I could talk to you all day long. You're so infectious. Oh, me too. This is nice. Great. Thank you. So please tell us everywhere we could stay connected with you guys. I want to know the website. I want to know your podcast information, your handles. Please, I need this information because okay. I got to go look some stuff up. Okay. Well, we have the World Nomads podcast, says what it is on the can there. And we have the World Nomads podcast Facebook group, which I'd love everybody to join. And, um, you know, we can, we share all our bloopers on there and all the things that Kim, the co-host and I do wrong. So it's, it's a bit of a laugh, that one. Uh, Worldnomads.com. That's where you can go get your insurance. You'll find the safety blog there. We've got an explore blog, which is kind of information about destinations to inspire you to travel as well. And we've got the stories blog on that as well, where we've got people to write some really fantastic first person travel stories of their own. Uh, it's just really brilliant stuff to read. It's it's fantastic. So worldnomads.com and the World Nomads podcast. And if you really, really, really um, um have got some information you want to send to me you can email email me at podcast at worldnomads.com awesome that is great and i'll put this information in the show notes so that Fantastic. you can just click 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 Thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe and rate the show.